us. We're all learning here. We have Lisa Sons tonight. She is the Natural Resources Coordinator at both Star Rock State Park and Matheson State Park. She will be talking to us tonight about backyard birds. Um, we've put up a screen uh, for next week's program. The postponed program with Natalie Martin will be next Tuesday on June 30th at six o'clock. So after we learn about backyard birds from Lisa tonight, we can figure out how to attract them to our yards next week with Natalie Martin. Um, those are actually pictures from my yard today, those birds. So landscaping for birds with Natalie Martin next Tuesday, June 30th at 6 p.m. We also have another program coming up after the holiday on July 7th at 6 p.m., again a Tuesday. And this is our solar system ambassador from NASA, uh, Joel Knapper. And he will be here to talk to us about the Moon Expedition 2024. Uh, as you probably know, um, July is a big month for the Moon and NASA because that's the, the month that Neil Armstrong um, made his expedition to the Moon. And so this is a look back and a look forward to 2024. We hope you can join us for both of those. And we have more programs like these coming up um, in the summer. And with that, I am going to introduce Lisa. Uh, Lisa, maybe you could possibly tell us more about yourself and then um, let us know about Backyard Birds. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Lisa Sons, as Donna mentioned. And let's see, I'm not new to Star Rock and Matheson, I started there back in December 2017. Prior to that, I was an outdoor educator and program specialist for Girl Scouts of Central Illinois Council. And I still operated as the volunteer program specialist at Star Rock, planning programs that, where we pulled presenters into the auditorium and they gave programs to the public. And before that, I worked for the National Audubon at Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary in Naples, Florida. That's kind of where my passion for birds came into play. Prior to that, I was an intern at Star Rock State Park right out of college. I went to school for forestry and park and recreation at Southern Illinois University. So some of my pastimes, of course, bird watching. That tends to relax me and also it's kind of a an I spy game in nature. Um, when you see movement in the bushes or in the trees or when you hear that bird call or you see that flash of color from maybe a bright blue indigo bunting or the yellow of an American goldfinch. It's just, I don't know, it's something nice that I like to do as, as a hobby, as a pastime. Plus you get your exercise in if you're hiking and out and about. Bird watching is one of those things that I think translates well over all demographics because whether you're able to get outside and hike or you don't have the ability to be as mobile, you can still find areas to bird watch, whether it's from your own balcony or back door, your own patio, so on and so forth. And Donna, do you have me on share screen so I can pull up the PowerPoint? Um, Barb, can you do that? You should be able to do that as a co-host, correct? Or do I have to do something else? I don't. Let me see if I can press it. I think you can. Go to yep. Here you go. Okay. There we are. All righty. Okay, so backyard birding, be prepared <laughs> to look for sales, especially on bird seed. Um, that will definitely help your pocketbook. Also be prepared not to get upset with squirrels and raccoons because they will also enjoy the bird seed that you put out. 
there are many different types of feeders available. And we're going to go over a, a few of those and you'll see a few pictures here. It all depends on what you would like to attract. So if you would like to attract wild birds such as American goldfinches, house finches, purple finches, so on and so forth, you'll want to look for wild bird food mix and it'll have it labeled. And that's typically a mix of your sunflower hearts, some of your Niger seed, some black oil sunflower seed, and some of your um, millet mixed in together. Sometimes it'll even have corn, dried corn. If you want predominantly birds with the larger beaks, I compare them to a pair of pliers like your cardinals. You're going to want the black oil sunflower. That will definitely attract your cardinals. Niger seed is for the birds that have smaller beaks like your American goldfinches, your house finches, purple finches. Suet. If you are like me and you like to be entertained by woodpeckers in the region, whether it's the red-headed, red-bellied, even um, hairy woodpecker or the smaller downy woodpecker, suet is what you're going to want to hang in your yard. And the middle box kind of has a little bit of a lilac background. You'll see it looks like a roof and then he's hanging from the bottom of it. That's a suet feeder. So they're typically cages and then you buy the suet in blocks. If you go on Pinterest, you can actually make your own suet. It is messy. It is a process. But if you want to save a little bit of money, you can make your own suet. We keep our suet cakes here in the freezer at home. At the park, they're in totes in the shade outside. And I'll switch from high protein suet, which is the fat mixed in with nuts and seeds in the winter, to more of a solid seed cake suet in the summer. Because you don't really want to put the fatty suet out in the summer because it'll get rancid and it'll attract things you don't want to attract. By summer, a lot of the insects, grubs, or larval stages of those insects are already produced within the barks of trees or fallen trees or the ground. So a lot of those birds that are attracted to suet in winter are going to be finding their natural substitutes this time of year. Peanuts, for any of you that like to watch blue jays, peanuts will attract your blue jays and they're part of the corvid family. So they're pretty neat to watch because they can sense just by picking up a peanut in their bill if it's a bad peanut or not, and they'll toss it aside. Be prepared to go through a lot of peanuts though if you want to attract blue jays. And they have these hangers that look like a wreath, like a metal wreath that you can fill with the peanuts that the blue jays can hang on to and grab the peanuts out of. Or here at home, we just kind of scatter them on a tray feeder. Nectar and fruit. For those of you that like to attract Orioles, Baltimore or Orchard Orioles, or rose-breasted grosbeaks in the spring, they typically come in in May and they'll pass through. So unless you have the suitable habitat for them to build a nest, they'll typically just come through in May, gorge on your oranges, your tangerines, you could put great jelly out, they'll then move back out um, and further north. Mealworms, if any of you live in a rural area where you have a larger yard, maybe bordered by some woods, you can attract bluebirds by putting out platform feeders of mealworms. And you can buy dried mealworms. I've seen them at Walmart in a bag. I've actually, just this year, for the first time, I saw suet cakes for, blue, for bluebirds that had mealworms. 
You can also buy live mealworms at some pet stores or even some bait shops. And that kind of helps out your bluebird buddies, especially in May, they will start looking for suitable homes, such as bluebird houses, if you put those up, holes in trees, usually anywhere from six feet to 10 feet up, and they can supplement their diet until they can find some more of those insects coming out into June and July. Bluebirds will typically have up to three or four clutches a year if their habitat is suitable and food is plentiful. So you can have hanging feeders. And hanging feeders, you wanna make sure they're sturdy and you pick a sturdy limb or eave of your house to hang them from. And be prepared that if you are gonna put them on a tree limb that squirrels will find a way to jump onto them. It's just in their nature. Platform feeders, over here to the right of the screen with the two cardinals and the black cat chickadee on top, that's kind of considered a platform feeder because it's on a pole from the ground. It's not freely suspended, like hanging from a tree limb. And then there are ground feeders, which I don't have pictured here, but a ground feeder you can simply build with a couple of pieces of two by fours and then a flat bottom of maybe plywood. And I have one of those at the park and I just basically sprinkle black oil sunflower seed into those feeders for a lot of the sparrows. I do want to make one comment before we go to the next slide. I have a picture up top here and I didn't realize I put that picture in. I didn't look that closely at it. The hummingbird feeder. You'll notice that the liquid inside is red. It has come to light that that is a big no-no now. The red dye that's put into a lot of the commercialized hummingbird feed that you see at Walmart, Farm and Fleet, Rural King, can actually harm their kidneys and harm their system. And you don't need to buy hummingbird feed. It is, it is so simple to make. I mean, it's basically like making Kool-Aid at home. It's just four parts of water. You warm up the water in a pan and then you add one cup of sugar and you stir until that sugar is dissolved. I then put it into just a basic pitcher, a plastic pitcher, and I put it in the fridge. And then I make a new batch usually every four days to a week. One thing with the hummingbird feeders, you want to make sure when days are getting more than 85 degrees or higher that you change out that feed every other day because it can go through a fermentation process and create bacteria and that bacteria can harm and kill hummingbirds if those feeders aren't changed regularly in the heat and if the feeders aren't cleaned appropriately. Here at home, we clean ours with a solution of vinegar and hot water and a scrub brush. And that's what I do at the park as well. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Home tweet habitat. So you wanna take a look at your yard to see what you have available. If you want to put up a backyard bird feeding station for backyard birding. Basically a few bushes or a couple of trees, something that, that can provide them with shelter or a place to hide if there's a predator in the area. Water source, you can put out a simple bird bath. I've also seen folks just use a basic bowl with some water in it. If that bowl is too deep, you can always put a rock in the bottom of the bowl. Um, so the water's just maybe an inch or so above it to allow them something to perch on. Maybe you have a creek or a river or a pond nearby. Doesn't have to be directly in your backyard. Natural food sources. I would definitely sign up for Natalie's program on June 30th. 
I'm certain that she's most likely going to go over landscaping, bringing these native bushes, trees, and plants into your landscape for birds, and that'll also include their natural food sources. So if you want to attract birds that are typically searching for fruit or berries like cedar waxwings, your Baltimore Orchard Orioles, your rose-breasted grosbeaks, indigo buntings, you're going to want to look for plants such as elderberry, some of your viburnums, and chokeberry, even some of your hollies will, will be an advantage. Other birds are going to look for sources of meat. They're gonna have more of a carnivorous diet so if you have an area like a, a small wood stand next to your property and you're thinking about clearing the trees that have fallen over onto the ground, you don't necessarily have to clean those up because those will naturally decompose. And as they decompose, those insects that are invited in to eat off of that dead wood will also be part of the food chain to provide food for some of those bird species like your woodpeckers, like pileated woodpeckers, red-headed woodpeckers, red-bellied, um, even yellow-bellied sapsuckers. Predators, look into your town ordinance. Some towns do not allow outdoor cats. Um, some towns don't really mind. Sometimes, you know, you might have to kind of weigh the odds. If you live on a farm and you want that outside mouser, be prepared that those outside mousers are also looking for easy prey with birds. So if you do have outdoor cats or your neighbors have outdoor cats, I would not recommend the ground feeders because you're basically just setting up an outdoor buffet for them. If you are gonna put up backyard feeders, make sure you do have that shelter in place, such as your bushes and trees, because cooper hawks and sharp shin hawks, like the one up in the right hand corner, will scope out those bird feeders. We have a cooper's hawk at the park that likes to sit on the fence that borders the bird feeders. So they will scope out those areas. They're, they're just doing their job part of the food chain, um, so be aware. But if you have more of that habitat, that shelter, it'll provide hiding places for those smaller birds. Window strikes. If you're going to put up bird feeders, say by your back doors, maybe you have sliding glass doors to your patio, and you've noticed some window strikes, that's mainly because they can't their vision can't differentiate. So you can buy clear stickers, they're almost like a hologram type sticker online. Some stores such as Farm and Fleet, and Rural King and Walmart might have those in their bird sections. I ordered mine from Amazon and they're, they're leaves and I stuck them up in our front windows and our sliding glass doors by the patio because we were getting a few window strikes. There's also a type of tape you can buy as well as a marker. And the marker is kind of like a dry erase marker and you can just put little X's on your window. It doesn't disturb your vision, but it disturbs their vision so they know not to go near those windows. Okay, now we're getting into the birds. So, We'll start with fall and winter. And some of our feathered friends that you might see out and about are gonna be your blue jay. Beautiful blue coloration, a little bit larger than a robin. So size comparison, look at your own hand, the size of an adult hand. And I usually call them the tattletale of the woods because whenever you go hiking, if blue jays are out, they are going to be the first ones that tattle on you and tell everybody else you're walking. I 
hope everyone could hear that. So they basically say their name. They'll scream J, 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 but they are part of the corvid family, which means they're related to crows. So they can have many different vocalizations. They can even mimic some other birds. And don't forget, they will dine on peanuts. They are also known to eat suet sometimes, especially if it has nuts in the suet. And then our state bird, the cardinal, the northern cardinal, and this is the male. The female will be more of a dusty, tannish yellow color. And the cardinal, I try to relate some of the sounds of birds to either their name or their features. And the cardinal has a very cheery call. And when I'm teaching younger students to mimic birds, for the cardinal, I'll ask them to repeat, cheerio, cheerio, or cheer, 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 or cheer, cheer, what, what? And sometimes they'll actually repeat you, though. The birds will sing back to you. So here's an example of the cardinal. Get to play. And the cardinals, if you look at their beak, their beak is very thick and triangular. This is so they can crack through those seeds, those hard sunflower seeds. I try to compare, there's a game that I play with students called Fill the Beak. And you use different utensils that you just find around the house or the kitchen that are comparable to the beaks of birds. So for the cardinal, we use pliers. Cardinal is smaller than a blue jay, about roughly the same size as a robin, maybe a little bit smaller than a robin. Then we move on to the black cat chickadee. The black cat chickadee out of these first three birds is going to be the smallest. They're going to be about the size of an American goldfinch. So if you take your index finger, your index finger on an adult is about a good three inches. That's going to be roughly their size comparison. Named for their black cap. And they also sound like their name. And if you repeat their call, you can actually train them to come in. Some people have actually trained chickadees to eat out of their hand. I don't personally recommend that. I kind of believe that there should always be a distance between wildlife and, and humans. Their call is. So they have a couple of calls. The one call that they're known for is like their name, chickadee dee 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 dee, chickadee dee 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 dee, and they will respond to that and they'll call back to you. Their other call is, hey sweetie, hey sweetie. And they have a more slender bill. They will eat seed as well as insects. And we get quite a few of these at the Star Rock feeders, especially when I put out the finch feed. Sometimes I'll even catch them on the wild bird seed feeders or even the suet cakes. And then a definite winter bird. They hang around throughout the winter and then usually migrate north as spring and summer approach. This is one of my first signs that spring is coming is when I no longer see the dark-eyed juncos. Named because of their dark eye and their dark features.
I'll play that again for you. And they're going to be more of a ground feeder. So if other birds or squirrels are kicking out seed from the hanging feeders, the dark eyed juncos are going to be the ones that you see on the snow on the ground picking that feed up out of the ground. And they'll typically go off after the wild bird seed. Oh, now it's going through the calls again. And all the calls for you. <laughs> Our next set of fall winter feathered friends, house sparrows. And house sparrows, the males will always have this black little chin bib right here. And they are going to be both ground feeders, platform feeders, and hanging feeders. Basically, they're an opportunistic feeder. They're going to eat whatever they can find. They're not picky. Kind of like a, a tweet with a scratchy throat. And then we have our woodpeckers, starting with our smallest, the downy woodpecker. And the downy woodpeckers, the males, will have a red cap here, whereas the females will not. And we have quite a few downy woodpeckers that visit our suet cakes at the park. Let me get that call. So they have a tiny little squeak, almost like a squeaky toy. And when they're trying to attract a mate or they're being territorial, they'll have a series of those squeaks all together. And if you're ever out hiking in the woods and you hear a very faint but rapid tapping on the trees, those are the downy. Then we have our larger woodpecker. The red belly is gonna be about the same size as a blue jay, so the size of your adult hand. And it's odd that they're called red bellied because their belly is actually more of a buff white color, but supposedly if, if you're a birder and you've banded birds before, they have kind of a rosy color if you push back the feathers on their belly, but nobody's really gonna get that close when you're bird watching. The males will have a red head from their bill right here all the way back to the nape of their neck. The females will also have red on their head, but it won't start at the bill. It'll start more around the eye line and back. They have almost a, a lattice work of black and white banding on their back wing feathers. Interesting thing about woodpeckers is how stiff and forked their tail feathers are. This actually acts like a clamp to help them kind of recline and rest back when they're on a tree. Plus the position of their toes, two up front, one in the back, unless it's the four-toed woodpecker, which is two up front and two in back, kind of dig in um, as another set of claws or clamps on the bark of the tree. Their specialized beaks are attached to their skull and act like a hammer, just hammering into that tree because they're looking for insects. They're looking for larvae, um, which are the worm-like stages of, of insects or grubs behind the bark. And sometimes if you're observing a woodpecker, if you set up a backyard birding station and you get woodpeckers in your yard and you look at one, say on a tree, you'll notice they tilt their head towards the tree. They're listening. 
They're listening for the sound of movement of insects behind the bark. Now, a really cool thing that I learned right out of college, basically when I worked at Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary, is that their tongue comes around and is wrapped around their skull so they can extend it and flick it out into those holes they have drilled. And at the end of their tongues, there's little appendages, almost like fingers on a hand that can grab that insect or that larvae, that grub, and pull it out and into their mouth. They have a lot of cool adapt adaptations. They're one of my most favorite birds. Now they're gonna sound similar to the downy, but a little bit more obnoxious, I guess I would say, a little bit louder. So let me play that call. And during mating season in the spring, I mean, the woods will just be alive with all this drumming from the downies, the red bellies, the redheaded, and the pileateds. And they're all trying to search for that mate by the louder they can drum or the louder their calls. Then we move on to the white-breasted nuthatch. They're about the same size as a chickadee. So remember your index finger, those three inches. And we actually get two nut hatches in the winter. We get the red-breasted nut hatch, which has more of like a rosy peach color to their breast, and they're a little bit smaller than the white-breasted. But the most common, I keep on losing my cursor, the most common is the white-breasted. And they have this beautiful blue-gray on their wing feathers and their back and tail feathers. And they defy gravity. They can climb up and down a tree any which way, hang upside down on branches. And this specialized pointy needle-like beak is there to help pick bugs and insects off of the tree bark or with kind of the cracks in between the tree bark. And they do enjoy suet cakes as well. So every birder hears something different and it's up to that birder to try to come up with either a mnemonic device or something that sounds similar to help them remember that call. So with the white-breasted nuthatch, I always think they're saying yak, 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 because they're yakking all the time. Yakking is another word for talking a lot. Now we move into spring and summer. And one of the first signs that I always see in spring are the return of the bluebirds. Now some bluebirds will overwinter in pockets in Illinois. I know we had about 20 of them on our Christmas bird count at Matheson. But the true indicator, I think, are the red-winged blackbirds, the turkey vultures, and the white pelicans that come into the park in spring. I have about five bluebird boxes here at home. We live on um, six acres and it's kind of a rolling hill. It used to be an old oak savanna with prairie underneath and then there's a creek that runs through it. And I check my bluebird boxes regularly. They, I would call them the OCD of the bird world. Or if you watch Friends, the TV show that used to be on TV, Monica, she was always cleaning, even wanted to clean other people's places. Monica, if she was a bird, would be a bluebird. So the Eastern bluebird, they like to scope out cavities. They're a cavity nester or boxes, because boxes that we provide are cavities that are clean. And then they will bring in nesting material that's usually grasses, 
sometimes even horse hair if there's horses in the area. And they'll build a small, um, dainty nest. It's not very plush. And they don't typically line it with anything. It's just those grasses. Now, sometimes I'll find one of my bluebird boxes is near a stand of pines we have. They'll also add some of the dry pine needles into their nest. So the male will go out and look for a suitable cavity and try to show the female like, hey, look at this nice house I found for you. If she accepts it, then they'll mate and they'll have a brood. And you just have to monitor the bluebird boxes because sometimes the boxes will have problems with ants. Sometimes you'll have problems with house wrens that try to build over the bluebird houses. And you'll always know it's a house wren nest because it's just a messy nest of sticks, like no rhyme or reason. And they'll stack it, I swear, like five inches high in the box. Or if it's a very messy grass that has like a mixture of litter, leaves, feathers, and grasses that's kind of higher up on one side, that means a house sparrow has invaded the bluebird box. And bluebirds are just, if you have the property and you have the habitat and you want to invite them in, then I definitely encourage that. Just know that it, it will become a hobby to clean those bluebird boxes, to check them. Once the babies have hatched from the eggs, I stop checking the box because you never want to deter, detour the um, parents from coming back to the nest. And you don't want to scare the young to fledge too early before they're ready. And that slender bill, again, they're an insect catcher. They will catch them either on the trees or bushes or in flight. And they'll also go after insects in the larval stage, such as caterpillars or grubs. And they like those mealworms. This cursor just does not want to obey. I don't know why I keep losing it. And this is their call. It's almost a, a warbly call, like they're gargling something at the same time they're trying to sing. I don't know why this keeps disappearing. Okay, then we have the red-winged blackbird. And right now, the red-winged blackbirds have nested and are raising their young. They are very territorial. And if you want to attract red-winged blackbirds to your yard, you will need some type of water source. They typically nest around a water source, such as a marsh, a wetlands, a creek, a river, a pond. They, they love to nest in cattails or different sedges and different grasses that would grow in those areas. If you like to go birding in the area and you want to see red-winged blackbirds, I would definitely recommend Dixon Waterfowl Refuge over near Hennepin. You can walk through their prairie into their marsh-like area down to the boat ramp. And I was just there last Monday and the males were dive bombing me because I was probably getting too close to their females and their nests. And their wing bar here is red and then sometimes this presents underneath as white or yellow. And this will become brighter closer to mating season. And they're also an insect eater and their call, you can actually mimic their call and sometimes they will call back. And I usually ask students to repeat after me and I'll say conch la -ri. So it's conch la -ri. And then the re is almost like you're trilling it um, or rolling your R's, I guess you could say, but instead you're rolling your E's. And I'll play that call for you.
And in spring, you'll see them lined up on all the telephone wires, sometimes some of the more wet ditches along roadways and interstates, you'll see the red-winged blackbirds. The females look nothing like the male. The females are more of a cream and tan stripe in color. And in the bird world, a lot of the females, well, they kind of miss, miss the whole fashion memo. They, they don't get to dress up like the males. The females are more dowdy, or I guess I should say more earth tones of tans, browns, creams, so they can blend in. Their job is to camouflage because they're protecting the nests and they're protecting the babies. The males are brightly colored, one, to attract the females, and two, to attract predators to get the predators away from the nesting area. The purple finch, this is one of my favorites. And the purple finch is different from the house finch because the house finch will not have as much of this reddish, I call it, it almost looks like they've been dipped in raspberry jam color. The house finch, why do I keep losing that cursor? The house finch will only have coloration basically up here on the head, a little bit on the chest, but not the whole body like the purple finch. And again, that beak, that conical shaped beak, just like the cardinal, this means they can really dig in and crunch those sunflower seeds apart to get into the sunflower heart. And they'll be attracted to both your hanging feeders with the wild bird seed, your Niger feeders or those hanging Niger socks, and some of your platform feeders if you put wild bird food out on the platform feeders like this one. The indigo bunting. This one literally looks like a little kid took a blue Crayola marker and went to town. It is a beautiful little bird. Again, about the size of your index finger. And this is actually my husband's favorite bird. He looks for this bird every May. And sometimes they'll come to your feeders. They're, they're more shy than some of the other bird species. They will be attracted to your wild bird seed. They do enjoy a diet of insects. So if you live in an area where your yard might be, you know, some of your yard's wet. Maybe you have some mosquitoes, maybe you have a creek running through it. They'll be attracted to those areas. So we usually find them down by our creek on the lawn area where they're looking for insects. And their call is a very high pitch squeak. Almost to me, it sounds like you're saying sweet, 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 sweet. And they will be attracted as well to some berries. Sometimes we find them at the top of Starved Rock on the Sandstone Butte. That's one of the highest areas of the park. And they're usually in and around the Eastern Red Cedars on those juniper type berries mixed in sometimes the cedar wax wings. Okay, moving on. I know a lot of us, um, if you are on Facebook, you can follow the Illinois Birding Network. That is an excellent place to learn from others. You can also post your pictures and questions about birds and they'll help you. And I know every spring, Illinois Birding Network comes alive because they're tracking migratory birds coming in from the south back to their northern homes for spring and summer. And everyone's on the lookout for the first ruby-throated hummingbird or the first Baltimore Oriole in their yards. There's actually a ruby-throated hummingbird 
websites and they track the migration of ruby-throated hummingbirds. So you can log on to the website, and I usually share this on the Starbrock and Matheson pages on Facebook in the spring. It'll show you when they're due in your area so you know when to put your feeders out. Because the birds that are migrating, like the Baltimore Oriole and the ruby-throated hummingbird, I mean, they're tired. They, they have hundreds, if not thousands, of miles underneath their wings, and they need to refuel. So putting out that bird seed, fruit, nectar for those migratory birds in April and May helps them out a great deal and also helps establish what they need in order to mate and build their nests. So the Baltimore Oriole, this is the male, beautiful orange coloration here on the chest, that solid black head. Now this is an adult male. The younger or immature males, one, one year old males will look quite different. They'll actually have more of a yellow coloration to them, similar to the females. And the Orioles are about the same size as an American Robin. So a little bit smaller than an adult hand. And their bill is mainly used for, for picking fruit. Sometimes they will eat insects. They have to. Some folks have even um, seen them eating seed. But for the most part, they're eating fruit. They're looking for fruit and nectar. The Orioles here at our house they absolutely love the grape jelly feeder that we put out, but you don't want to put out too much grape jelly because that's actually a very high concentration of sugar for them. So it shouldn't be something that's out all year for them. Oranges are better, tangerines. And sometimes I've seen them on our hummingbird feeders. And you can buy Oriole feeders that are similar to a hummingbird feeder, but they have larger openings for their beaks and their tongues. And their call is actually similar to a robin. So American Robin is cheerio, cheery up, cheery me, cheerio, cheery up, cheery me. And the Oreo sounds very similar to that, but a little bit more of like cotton balls in the mouth. So it's not as clear or enunciated. Then we have the American Goldfinch. Again, finches about the size of your index finger. And this is the male and their coloration will change throughout the year. So closer to the season where they're breeding and nesting, their yellow will become brighter and brighter and brighter. And the males have this little black cap. The females will be more of a, a downy yellow color, almost like it's faded. And they're looking for smaller seeds such as thistle. So when you see Thistles such as bull thistle or even Canadian thistle blooming, they'll be all over those plants eating the seeds. And in native prairies that have some of those native thistles, they'll actually choose to nest in those thistles or nearby those thistles. And they'll use the seed heads that are similar to almost a milkweed where it has that little piece of fluff, almost like a parachute to carry the seed, they'll use that to line their nests. And these love the Niger seed, the little black seeds that you can hang in socks or you can buy in the bags to put in hanging feeders. They'll also go after the wild bird food with the smaller seeds. So their call, some birders actually hear the words potato chip in their call, like potato chip, 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 
I don't hear it, but whatever works for you. It's just a very high pitched, uh, melodious song. And then the ruby-throated hummingbird, the smallest of all birds that we'll talk about tonight. And their wings can move both forward and backward. That's why it looks like they're hovering over a flower or over the feeder, is because they're actually moving those wings backward and they're hovering. They're long, slender beaks. Again, when I play that game with students called Fill the Bill, we use straws or we use the little, um, oh, what are they called? Like the little siphons, pipits, to mimic hummingbird beaks. And they have a very long tongue that will come out once their bill is fully in that flower or that feeder and they'll lap up that nectar. So they are mainly nectar eating animals. This is a male, that bright red ruby throat, and this will actually get very colorful, very vibrant during mating season. The females will not have this ruby colored throat. It's a very constant, high-pitched chatter. Constant chatter, it's not a true song or a true call, it's just constant chatter. And here's the house finch, and you'll see that coloration difference between the house finch and the purple finch from the earlier slide. The house finch only has that reddish color here on the chest and on the head, not throughout the entire body like the purple finch. Again, that conical bill to help tear open those seeds like the black oil sunflower seed or the wild bird seed. Okay. All right, resources. When I first started birding, I used the National Audubon website quite a bit. I also used Cornell University Lab of Ornithology website. And then as smartphones develop further apps for those of us in the great outdoors, I started using eBird, eBird app for smartphones lets you plug in if you see an unusual bird. Say you were out driving in the farm fields, I don't know, north of Interstate 80 and all of a sudden you saw a huge white bird on long legs with a red cap. Well, first you wanna look up what that is and that's most likely going to be a whooping crane and then you'll notice that that is an endangered species. So you can plug it into eBird by location so others can know about it. Also, if you're looking, say in wintertime, oh, I wanna see a snowy owl, I haven't seen a snowy owl before. You can go to the eBird app and type in snowy owl and your location and it'll pull up where other people have pinged a snowy owl in your area. Once you get used to birds in your neighborhood or on your hikes, through the utilization of guidebooks. Um, Peterson puts out a really nice guidebook. So does Audubon and Stokes, as well as National Geographic. And those will, will help beginners by leafing through the books and the indexes and getting used to the different bird families and species. You can then download apps like the Merlin app. And this is an app I commonly use on my phone that helps me, usually I'm, I'm trying to remember calls, not necessarily what they look like, but calls. 
And at the Star Rock Foundation, um, the bookstore actually has quite a few bird books. Unfortunately, when I put this together, this was prior to COVID-19. So the bookstore isn't open just yet. Hopefully we'll be open this fall. But you can find a lot of those guidebooks on birds at your local libraries, as well as Amazon, or maybe some other parks that might have their gift stores open. I know that the Morton Arboretum just opened up their doors a few weeks ago to non-members. I don't know if their gift store is open yet though. And then always look up different classes, whether they're online or in your area, local state parks and nature preserves or nature centers. Sometimes they'll have beginning birding classes on how to use binoculars or what to look for in regards to bird shape, bird silhouettes, and different bird habitats. So if you were wanting to look for waterfowl, you wouldn't necessarily go to the woodlands. You would go more towards the river, the creeks, and the lakes. And that's it. Okay, I didn't know. Um, Barb or Donna, if you wanted to open it up for questions at this time. We have several, Lisa, in the chat box, so I'll just read them to you and you can let us know more about it. One okay. second, let me go to the top. All right, is there a certain time of year I can attract Orioles to my yard? I know you mentioned the spring. I saw some earlier in the year and I started offering food, but they have disappeared. Yes, typically, typically Orioles in this area of Central Illinois are coming in very end of April, early May. It all depends on the weather patterns. And they don't always stay. So if you're putting out oranges, tangerines, or grape jelly, you kind of have to stick with it. So try it again next year. And birds have excellent memory. They will remember those areas on migration that provided food and shelter. My husband and I have been putting food out for Orioles for, oh my goodness, 15 years. And literally, this is the first year where they've hung out all summer. So I'm pretty sure they've got a nest somewhere on site, but I haven't found it yet. So just hang with it. About the Orioles, about the Orioles, if you uh -huh. move their, um, their food source, I have an Oriole feeder, to what? what? What kind of tree should I put it near so that I attract them? Orioles typically build a, a round nest that hangs. It's a basket-type nest that hangs from branches. And the branches can be anywhere from 10 to 20 feet up above the ground. And for some reason, they're attracted to water sources. Um, that's not always the case. At the park, when you pull in the west entrance off of 178, right before you get to the park hill to go up to the lodge, there's an actual nest hanging right across from the park maintenance sign. I don't, I don't know. Bad parenting right there. I went build a nest above a major park road. So I, I would probably move their feeders to where they have more shrub-like or, or tree shelter so they're not fully exposed if it's out in the open. Okay. How often do you clean the bluebird boxes? When do you start checking so as not to bother the parents? And where, oh, and where do red-winged blackbirds nest? So the bluebird boxes, I will check them in early April. So early April, I'll go out and I just take, you can get some of those really cheap um, flathead paint brushes. They come in like a package of four or six, I think at Hobby Lobby or your hardware store. I take that with me and then I take a, um, a bottle of vinegar and water solution. And I first will sweep out the boxes and then I will take that solution and I'll spray it down. And then usually I have either like an old scrub brush or um, even a Brillo pad that doesn't have any soap or anything on it. And I'll clean that out and then let it dry. 
Then after I clean the boxes, I just kind of monitor them as I'm just walking around the yard. Once I start seeing the nesting material go in, I'll monitor it about every few days, every, you know, every, every few days to once a week. Once I see the eggs go in, I'll check back in another couple of weeks because I don't want to startle anyone off. And then once I see those babies hatch, I will leave it alone. And for bluebirds, I'd have to look it up again. I can't remember what their incubation rate is. Most birds incubation can be anywhere from 14 to 38 days. So I'd have to look up bluebirds again. But you just, once they get covered in their, their blue feathers, you don't wanna bother that nest again until they've fledged, till they've left. Um, with the Migratory Bird Act, you have to be careful because if house wrens have already built in that bluebird box, or say black cap chickadees, which their nest is very compact, and they'll line it with moss, and usually like animal hair, like if you brush your cat or dog in the neighborhood and it's found in a nest, it's usually a chickadee nest, you can't clean out those nests. You, you, you have to leave them there because of the Migratory Bird Act. Um, I think I answered that pretty much. Okay. And like I yeah. said, if it's a good year, they'll, they'll have up to three to four clutches all the way up through August. Blackbirds, blackbirds will nest in cattails. So they nest in water sources, whether it's a marsh near a wetland, or sometimes when you're driving along, you see those wet ditches along 80 or 39, and there's cattails in there. So they nest in cattails and they use grasses and such to build their nests and they weave them in between the cattail stalks. And they're nesting right now. Okay, we have a last question. How do I attract the indigo bunting, uh, berry bushes, and what for habitat? Um, the indigo bunting is, is, a, is a tough one. They are a migratory bird, so they'll come through in May. I think if you have those native berry bushes and you have you know a water source, I mean, they're after mainly the insects and sometimes the berries to supplement their diet. So things like chokeberry, um, if you have an arbivite, like a, a northern white cedar and eastern red cedar. I'm trying to think of some other berries. Sweet spire will have berries. I mean, like I said, ours, I only spotted them down below by our creek in the grass. There's about five of them and then they flew off to the treetops. So they're looking mainly for those insects. But if you have a good wild bird seed from the store and you put it out, I've seen them on that wild bird seed as well. Okay, I don't see any more questions. I wanna thank you, Lisa. This was a great program. I'm going to go home and start working on rearranging my feeders. Uh, I hope everyone else enjoyed this. We will. Um, put all of this information on our website and we will have the recording with a link posted shortly. Um, thank you all for attending and thank you Barb for hosting. We no very much problem. appreciate it. All righty, thanks very much. Everyone have a great night. Thank, thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you Donna, thank you Barb. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye bye. Thanks, bye bye.